Hi, and welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash, and today we're joined by Michael Nicoletos. Michael is the founder and CEO of DeFi Advisors based in Athens. Um, we're also joined by Tracy Shukart of Hill Tower Resource Advisors and Albert Marco. Um, guys, thanks so much for joining us. We have a couple of key things, and I was really in a questioning mood when I put these together. Um, the first one is around Russia and the CNY. There was an announcement this week um, my question really is why? What, what's the point of that? Um, next is where does the Fed go from here? And really where do all central banks go from here, but mainly the Fed, ECB. Um, Albert's going to lead on that. And I'm, I know Michael has some views on that as well. That'll be really exciting to talk through. Um, and then uh, we'll talk to Tracy about energy. You know, we for the first part of this week, we saw energy on an uptrend and, and we've seen a little bit of turbulence on Friday. So, you know, when do we expect to see uh, an uptrend uh, in energy? So again, guys, thanks for joining us, Michael. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, from Athens to uh, uh, to get involved with us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Happy to be here. Great. Love to talk to you guys. Great. So first, uh, Michael, I know that you know, you, you know a lot about China and, um, you know, you follow a lot of their economic activity. Um, and I saw you commenting on this uh, Russia announcement about CNY. Um, of course, they announced that they'll, um, they'll use CNY for trade settlement outside of the U.S. and Europe, uh, which is Latin America, Africa, and Asia is what they said in their announcement. So that's about 37% of Russia's exports. So I put a little chart together. I used UN Comtrade data. Um, this is 2021 data, which is the latest data that UN Comtrade has. Um, so, you know, if they're really doing that, Latin America is 2% of Russia's trade. Um, Africa is 3% of Russia's trade. China is 14%, okay? Um, and so I guess is all of their trade with China settled in in CNY? I seriously doubt it. And then Asia is a rest of Asia is 18%. Okay. So um, and of that, about 1%, just under 1% is Taiwan. Uh, so I seriously doubt Taiwan would settle in CNY. But what's obvious from looking at this chart is Europe is more than half of Russia's trade. So it, it's not as if this is necessarily a massive bold announcement that everything is going to be in CNY uh, from here on out. Um, it, it really is just kind of putting a stake in the ground saying, I think it's almost a best efforts thing. So I guess, is this viable? You know, that's that's really the question. And Michael, you put out this thought provoking tweet. Um, you said, if, you know, if that were the case, China would have no issues running out of USDs. So, so let's, take that on and, and help me understand why is China trying to do this and what is the US dollar question that you have uh, around this arrangement? Well, first of all, uh, again, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Now, there are, we need to, to segregate two things. Wanting to do something and being able to do something. It's clear, it's clear that a lot of a lot of countries which are de highly dependent on the US dollar for trading would rather be on something else and not be uh, dependent on the dollar. We, we saw what happened with the uh, Russian FX reserve when the war started. So clearly this was a warning shot or a lot of countries said we could be next if we go into a fight with the US. So clearly there is a tendency and, and China wants this to happen as soon as possible. Now, Happen, for this to happen, there are a lot of things that need to happen first. I'll give just a, an anecdotal example because we, we we get all this news flow and all these headlines where one signs an agreement with another and then two people or two uh, prime ministers come up and say, we're going to do it. And everyone takes it for granted, especially on Twitter. It's a bit, you know, it's either 
a fanatic from one side or a fanatic from the other side. <laughs> so again, I, I'm, 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 I, I'm, I agree with everyone who is afraid of this happening. I mean, in the sense that a lot of people are saying that the end of the dollar is close and that uh, everyone's going to go to something different. I agree there is the, 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 the willingness. I'm not sure this can happen soon. And I don't think it can happen uh, without some conflict occurring somewhere. So uh, an, uh, an example is that in 2018, Iran signed an agreement with China to sell oil in uh, Iran. Still, after four or five years, the, the volumes are ridiculously low. So again, there are agreements, but in order to enforce them and in order for them to happen, they take a lot more time than one would want. So Russia had no option. So because of the of the sanctions, they still sell to Europe uh, a few things, but they're trying to to uh, outweigh it by selling more to China. And China and Russia are trying to make these agreements where they will be settling in rubles or in won, and they try to make uh, uh, these agreements. You know, they want to expand them to other countries as well. However, you see, that, for example, India. Uh, India doesn't want to settle in won or doesn't want to settle in ruble. They want to sell in uh, dirhams, which is back to the dollar. So you get all this information, and the data, at least until now, does not support that there is a threat to the dollar. There is a threat to the dollar in terms of willingness. There is no threat to the dollar in terms of data, which says that this is going to happen tomorrow. So I think that this will, will eventually happen, but I don't think it will happen soon. And I think until it happens, we're going to see a few episodes and uh, these episodes are not straightforward how they will evolve. Now, regarding China and its macro, the, the reason I'm saying what I'm saying, and I'm saying that China needs dollars, China has been dependent, first of all, on its real estate, which was like 30% of its GDP. We saw what happened to the real estate. The second leg was it was highly dependent on exports. There is a global slowdown, so these exports will have some issues. And now, how has China managed to keep this uh, economy running? I'll give you an, uh, a few metrics to understand. The US is an economy which is like 26, I think 26 trillion of GDP. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, its M2 is around 21 trillion. In, in, in China, the GDP is around 17 trillion, all in dollars, okay? So, and M2 is $40 trillion, 40, four, zero. So what, is it, what does that mean? The China government prints money, prints money, prints money, because there are capital controls. The balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but the money can't leave, or it can leave for selected few, and I'll explain how it leaves. And for the rest, because there are capital controls, the money can't leave, so it stays in. But this is in one. Some try to buy gold. Some try to invoice, over-invoice to Hong Kong and take it out of Hong Kong. But when the disparity is so big, Clearly, there is a problem. There's an MPL problem. Chinese banks are like four times China's GDP. They're sorry, like sorry, they're MPL like, is non-performing loans. Non-performing loans. Sure sorry. That, sorry. Uh, yeah, sometimes yeah, it's non the non-performing. You cannot have an M2 of 40 trillion and a GDP of 17 trillion and not have non-performing loans. Chinese sorry. banking system. Sorry, I just want to go back, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, no. I just want to make sure that people understand. China has currency in circulation of 40 trillion dollars and they have a gdp of 17 trillion dollars whereas the u.s has a gdp of what you say 24 trillion i don't remember what number you're 26 using. 26 I 26 think. trillion and they have 21 trillion in circulation right so for all of these people who talk about china being this economic model for other people why does it matter that their M2 is more than double the size of their economy? Well, uh, let me say some. First of all, let's put something that the U.S. is also the global reserve currency. So everyone in the world wants dollars. It's not like only the U.S. wants dollars. Uh, at, at, at this stage, uh, less than 10% of the world wants one. So it's not like everyone wants to get the Chinese. One, I think. I think it's 2.1% of transactions or something like that. 2.8%. 2.8, yeah. Transaction. Okay. <clears throat> I, I, I saw a number which was around 6%. Maybe I'm wrong. So, okay. But again, it's 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 a number which is very small. So, he, uh, sorry, got stuck. Give me a second. Uh, sorry. So, uh, 
all this money that is in the economy, if if you if there was given if you if Chinese people were given the choice, they would be able to take it out. The economy is growing at a faster space, uh, pace than its potential. I'll, I'll give you a number. Right now, Chinese banks are more than 50% of global GDP in terms of size. In, in the US, I think was the US, I think its peak was 32% in 1985, and Japan's 27% in 1994. So we, we've passed all metrics in, in terms of the world dominant power or the dominant economy, if you want to put it this way, uh, being a uh, percentage of GDP in terms of banking assets. So the, the, the banking assets clearly have a lot of bad debts in there, which we cannot know what they are because the Chinese economy wants, the, the Chinese government wants to, to, to control that. Now, there was a special committee put in place this month, I think, in order to, to oversee the financial situation in China. So I'm pretty sure they're a bit worried about it. They tried to, they want to, to, to switch from an export oriented economy to a consumption driven economy, but this is still less than 40% of GDP. And this takes a lot of time to go, like the, the US is around 70%. So it takes a lot of time to go from 40%, 70%. Now, all this money stays in China. They have no option. They can't do anything. So uh, it, it's an issue and I'll give you a ratio. If you if you take their FX reserves, it's around three trillion, three point something trillion. If you if you divide M two FX to M two, it's around seven percent. So if that money were to want, if that money wanted to leave, in theory, only seven percent can be covered by FX reserves. The the FX reserves of the government. I'm, I'm just to clarify, in the the Asian tiger crisis in ninety seven, the tigers collapsed when the ratio went below twenty five percent. So they didn't have that support to keep it up. And just Again, to be clear, for the U.S., that's a hundred percent, right? <laughs> yeah, the U.S. is a hundred percent. The U.S. <laughs> doesn't have any problems. Right. <laughs> so uh, this is something that needs to be addressed, and I don't know how they will address it. They try to to make all these agreements so that the one becomes a tradable currency, and they can uh, invoice in one. So if if the one, in theory, was to become the global reserve currency tomorrow morning, their debt would become the world's problem. Now they haven't managed to export that. Right. So they need these dollars to keep that balloon, let's say, from, from all the air in the balloon to be to be taken up. They need to they need these FX reserves to keep the money in. And they need to build confidence. And they try to build confidence with with narratives and not with data. But right. again, they don't have a choice right now. In my so CA Futures is our subscription platform for global markets and economics. We forecast hundreds of assets across currencies, commodities, equity indices, and economics. We have new forecasts for currencies, commodities, and equity indices every Monday morning. Uh, we do new economics forecasts for 50 countries once a month. Within CI Futures, we show you our error rates. So every forecast, every month, we give you the one and three month error rates for our previous forecasts. Uh, we also show you the top correlations and allow you to download charts and data. Uh, CI Futures is available for $58 a month, $75 a month, or $99 a month. You can find out more or get a demo on completeintel.com. Thank you. So, so the difference between say the onshore and offshore CNY or CNH or whatever, there is a huge difference uh, in perceived value, I would think. You can't change the perceived value of CNY onshore but offshore, if people are nominating contracts in, say, I'll say CNY in quotes, um, there is a there is an exchange right there. But again, this M2 issue, which I can't stress how important that is, I've, I haven't heard anybody else talking about this. And it's so critical to understand the, the kind of the fiat value of CNY itself, right? Because it's not it's it's not limited and the government because they're effectively fun tickets with Mao's face on it right 
Um, <laughs> and that that's and that's how the PBOC was treating it. And again, when people talk about CNY as a global reserve currency, nobody is looking at the integrity of the PBOC. And nobody is looking at how the PBOC manages monetary policy in China. I will give you uh, I'll give you anecdotal uh, information. I haven't checked the number for a few years, uh, but the last time I checked, uh, if you look at the import export numbers from China, from Hong Kong to China, and you look at it, the PBOC, and then you go and see the same numbers in the HKMA, you would assume that these four numbers should be the same, not the same. Import should be exports, and export should be imports. The numbers should be very close. The discrepancy is huge. These numbers do not reconciliate, which right. means that in some form, there is some over-invoicing to Hong Kong. Of course. Kong. And, and, and you're and, not talking and, about 30%. You're talking about multiples. You're, you're talking about a lot. I, I, the, the, it, it's ridiculous. So yeah. I, I think, and if you see, the, the peg, the Hong Kong peg has been you know, stable to the uh, upper bound lately because I guess because of the interest rate a differential, a lot of money is leaving. So it's putting pressure on Hong Kong as well. So it remains to be seen what happens there. So let me let me go to Tracy. Tracy, in terms of Russia using CNY, okay, and I know you look at a lot of their energy exports, and of course there's all this official dumb around sanctions and stuff, but what's your kind of guess on Russia using either USD or proxy USD dirhams or something else as currencies for collecting on on energy exports or commodity I mean, exports more more broadly. Well, first, I think that they prefer dollars, no matter what. And this was kind of China saying we want to trade in yuan, and Russia said okay, but you know that that was a suggestion that does not mean that it's necessarily happening. But what is really interesting is earlier this week on Monday. Um, Russia laid out uh, uh, conditions for extending the grain, the black grain, the black sea grain deal, mm -hmm. right? Because it was uh, it was supposed to be for ninety days, but they cut it to sixty days because they're trying to use that as leverage. And one of the things that they are trying to use as a leverage is they will extend the deal, or they'll give, or the other part is they'll give African countries just free grain. <laughs> instead of selling it. But um, one of the big conditions for that was for uh, the removal of some Western sanctions, specifically to get them back on SWIFT. And so if that happens, forget it. So everything's it's going to be all, you know, the, the trade will be all euros and dollars, not. But I thought SWIFT was terrible and everybody wanted on SWIFT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think I just thought it was important to, Point out Absolutely. because you know, if they get back on SWIFT, obviously that's going to make trading in dollars easy for everything, right. all commodities across the board. Right. And it. so that goes back to what Michael said initially about, about kind of these guys really want dollars and, you know, all this other stuff. It's there's the official dumb of the prime ministers meeting each other. Right. And then there's the, the factual activities they undertake based on the reality of their position in the world economy. Right. Well, Albert, what, are you, what are your thoughts here? I mean, I agree with Michael and Tracy. I mean, to to talk about the reserve currency switching from the dollar to the um, yuan is a joke, to be honest with you. It's I, I do do you do have some people in other countries, you know, in the Middle East and China and whatnot, talking about you know the the death of the dollar in actual serious tone. But any anyone with even like a shred of financial backing. And insight knows that it's just an impossible thing. I mean, from from what it sounds like, it, it's m more of like a barter system. But you know that introduces even bigger problems. I mean, there, you you can't scale it up. There's no standardization. How do you value things to be to begin with? That's it. Right? So uh, you don't you can't value. There's yeah, the valuing goods and services without using the dollar right now is just an impossibility. And right. and on top of that, you have the political problems that come along with it. I mean, like the Saudis. They want dollars for their oil. They they need defense assistance. The Greeks needed U.S. defense assistance. The Turks, as much as they want to make noise, um, again they're reliant on the U.S. and NATO for for defense and whatnot. So right. it's like you know you, th these components 
not just financially, what Michael talked about and said it much more eloquently than I would ever would, but there's also political components that you just can't, you just can't get around in the near term. But even if they had a barter system, they would reference the, the price in dollars, right? Well, yeah. Like if you oil don't do is that, worth 10 billion, your chocolate yeah, is worth I 2 mean, billion. This, was, yeah, this yeah. goes back to like, Iran did that when they were first sanctions, um, you know, over a decade ago. Um, they were trading oil for, for gold, but it was still referenced in dollars. Of yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and on top of that, you you run the risk of hyperinflation, eliminating dollars from your Fed from your FX reserves and starting to trade away from the dollar. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna end up in a hyperinflation event. Right. And then uh, can I say something? Can I say yeah, something thanks. about? Yeah. All these points are I agree with all the all these points. There's one more thing. Let's say you trade in rubles and you trade in one. Okay. It means that you're gonna keep FX reserves in rubles or in one. Mm -hmm. So you feel more comfortable keeping a, a, a currency from an authoritarian regime, regime than holding the U.S. dollar, which is fully liquid, fully tradable, and anyone in the street will take it at a split of a second. For, for the, you, need, you need many years of, 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 of track record to, to build that, uh, that trust. We, we might, you know, there are a lot of bad things about the dollar. We agree that I don't think anyone will say that it's a perfect me mechanism. But right now, it's very functional. It's very liquid. And if you want to keep your reserves in U.S. Treasuries, you can sell them at the split of a second. There's nothing. There's nothing. You don't have any issues with that. If you, if you, if you have one, you're going to do what? You're going to buy Chinese government bonds? And how will you sell them if the PBOC calls you and says, it's not a good idea to sell your... <laughs> Uh, Chinese bonds this week, right. we would prefer to keep it in. Right. Uh it Ultimately, also this is a bet right. on the central bank, right? Yeah. If you're holding rubles, you're betting that the Russian central bank is trustworthy. If you're holding CNY, you're betting that the Chinese central. So what what, what central banks are, are out there that you could potentially trust? You have the Fed, you have the ECB, you have BOJ, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. W w those are really the only, only three that are visible enough that have the scale and transparency to manage a currency. And look what the BOJ has done since, you know, since Abenomics, you know, look at, and on and on and on. Do you trust the ECB? I, I don't know. I mean, and it, it becomes, do you trust the ECB or the Fed more? I mean, sorry, but I, I just don't trust the ECB. So I don't trust, oh, well, the let, really, let, 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 but I, trust I, I don't trust the ECB, them. but it's relative. I mean, you, you don't have a problem keeping euros. Maybe it's not your preferred choice. But you don't lose right. your sleep on holding euros. Let me put it That's this way. That's exactly right. At least right. at this stage. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay, guys, this is great. Let's move on to the next thing because I think we all agreed violently here, but I think <laughs> we're going to not agree on the next one, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> so, so let's talk about central banks and where where does the Fed and where do other central banks go from here? So, of course, we saw the Fed raise this week. Um, I think it was the right thing to do, Albert. I know you think it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, markets have been up and down since then. And Albert, you've said that you expect the Fed to raise two more times. Um, and I want to talk about kind of what's behind that assertion. And then we get silly statements like this one from the RBNZ in New Zealand, where the chief economist basically says, if inflation expectations don't fall, we'll be forced to do more regarding interest rates. Well, of course, duh, like why, why wouldn't you do that? So can you walk us through a little bit, kind of just very quick, because there have been thousands of hours of Fed analysis this week, but like, why do you think the Fed's going to raise two more times? Uh, Supercore is trending up and it continues to trend up. Services are on fire. Uh, real estate numbers have been on fire. There's no slowdown in, in reality. I mean, even there's no... The layoffs have been slow. They've come from the tech sector. They haven't come from construction or any other blue collar jobs at the moment. So until we see that, you know, the the, the economy is going to be red hot and it's a problem for the Fed. Okay. You know, it's a problem for inflation overall. Okay. So play devil's advocate here. Banking crisis. Fed had to bail out banks, all this other stuff. So why isn't the Fed saying let's pause on the banking crisis worries? Because banks are fully liquid. Uh, uh, 
fully liquid. The big banks have no problem whatsoever. Some of these smaller banks that have no risk protocols are getting exposed. The tech heavy, uh, tech heavy investments are getting exposed. Everyone knows that higher rates hurts the tech sector the most. And those banks were at fault. They didn't hedge properly. Now you have because of duration have risk. I, I just want to be clear. I, I just want to make sure that people understand. You're not saying that uh, they failed necessarily because they're tech, but they they failed because of duration risk, and then their tech depositors took their money out, right? Absolutely, right. absolutely. So, but but the but the banking system overall is not really at risk. You know, they're they're just shaking out some of the weaker players, but that was inevitable as interest rates have risen. You know, a lot of this problem, a lot of the problems stem from the Fed and them guaranteeing four, five, six percent, you know, deposits while the banks only do one percent. and right. They can't compete with that. Right. Michael, I know that you think this wasn't the right <laughs> action. So what's your perspective? Well, let me let me say something first. I, I, I believe that it was a mistake and I'll say why it was a mistake. I, I think it's a mistake. when when you raise interest rates you as a, as a central bank and the banks follow by raising rates on the loan side and on the deposit side, uh, what do you do? You make debt more expensive and then you make people because you have, let's say a 5% interest rate on your bank, you create an opportunity cost so people want to save. So you, you reduce liquidity from the deposit side and also you reduce loan demand because it's more expensive and that creates a slowdown. What happened now? Because we had 20 year, 10 years of QE, everyone forgot that there was an interest rate on the deposit side. So the Fed and the ECB and all the central banks raised the interest rates. So the loan side adjusted, that became more expensive, but the deposit side stayed zero at 1%. I don't know where it's in the US, but it's really low. At some point, people started waking up when it arrived at 4% and they suddenly started saying, okay, I don't have any, any interest on my deposit. Let me put my money in the money market fund. How much does it give? Three, four, five percent. I don't know. It's a, it's a much higher rate. So I, I think I saw somewhere today that around five trillion have gone into money market funds. The number's close to that. So when you take your money out of the deposit and you take it to a money market fund, this is the equivalent of a bank run for the bank that you're taking the money. It, it's a deposit living. It, it might not feel like a bank run, but it, on the balance sheet of a bank, it's, it's a bank run. So this started happening. And again, because of what you mentioned, they had invested in treasuries uh, and the duration risk was a mismatch. They didn't do, some of them at least, hadn't done appropriate uh, hedging. They, they started losing money and they started selling this bond at a loss, although they had them at the healthy maturity portfolio where you don't need to take a mark to market loss, and suddenly both sides of the balance sheet were were screwed. Let me put it this way. So a few banks started going under. Now, I know that the central bank has come up, and I know a lot of people come up, and I I, I do agree that there's no systemic risk, but and I mean that I don't see a cascade of people losing their deposits, but nevertheless, people feel uncomfortable and try to do something about it, either take them more at market money market funds or take their money from a regional bank if they can to JP Morgan or one of the big guys. This creates a big problem for the economy. Uh, yes, there are some signs which show that the economy is still robust, but I think a lot of leading indicators suggest that the economy is slowing down. And most of the metrics coming from the inflation side have collapsed. Yes, core CPI is still high and it's a lagging the, uh, indicator so it will take time for it to come down but i think that given the stress we saw uh this week and why do i say that because we, we look at the us as a closed system it's not when you raise interest rates as the fed and you are the global reserve currency you create a global credit crunch you saw that last week the fed had to come out with swap lines for everyone you saw today that foreign banks borrowed 60 billion in liquidity, the ones that didn't have a swap line. So, and we see today Deutsche Bank being in the headlines and Commerce Bank being in the get everything. So you, you might think that the US system is okay, but it creates a, a, a domino effect, which we're starting to see. Uh, we saw Credit Suisse going under in a deal which was not 
uh, I'd say, what we would think of. I, I believe that that deal in combination with the high rates is, is, is probably the, the, the root of the problem in the sense that they destroyed the capital structure. They wiped out all the 81s without wiping out the equity holders, which means now that in Europe, everyone's wondering if my 81 is of any value. And that creates another uncertainty. In combination with the higher interest rates and the stress that has started to build up, I think we've passed the moment where, okay, let's, it could be debatable if they did right or if they did wrong. The, the US bond market is saying that it was a wrong, it was a mistake, the two years at 370. And the, so the bond market went from the one side and the Fed went on the other side. Now, so help, he, he, help everybody, he, sorry, understand, me, help everybody me, understand why the two year at 270 is important. 370. Uh, 370, sorry. Yeah, 370. Because if in two years you're getting 3.7% and the Fed fund rate is five, someone, me, it means that someone is buying a two year uh, bond getting much less, which means what? The, it means that the market is saying rates are, rate cuts are coming soon. So the market is saying, there's no way we can keep it this way. And the Fed is saying the opposite. Historically speaking, the bond market has been right if we take it into context. It could be this time that they're wrong. It feels to me at least from the stress I look in, in global markets and not in US only, that things are getting a bit out of hand. And having a bank like Credit Suisse go under, which is a big bank, and uh, having all the central banks come in together on a Sunday night to give up swap lines, it means that the stress in the system, it's much bigger than we think. Yeah, but Sunday night is the best time to get swap lines. <laughs> <laughs> so, so okay, so you, you talk about European banks, but we had uh, Mueller from the ECB uh, out this week saying, I wouldn't worry about a financial crisis in Europe. So, you know, we, we have ECB guys out there going, yeah, Credit Suisse happened and we know Deutsche is, you know, an issue, but I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that in Europe. So I, I think we're we're seeing statements from Yellen, the Fed, the ECB, other guys who are saying, no, there's nothing to see here. But then we see things kind of blowing up all over the place. Right. Um, and then we we have a question, especially for, specifically for you, Michael, from a, a viewer uh, who said, I'd like Michael's thoughts on the EU, particularly banks, pensions, and future growth prospects. So can you talk us through how does this how do these banking issues in Europe flow through to European pensions? First of all, let's say something. We're lo we're talking about the US and uh, duration risk on the bond losses. Let's remind everyone that at the peak of uh, QE, 18, 1, 8, 18 trillion worth of bonds had negative yield. And these were mostly Europe and Asia. So pension funds and banks in Europe, which are forced to buy these bonds, were buying bonds with a negative yield. So they were losing on day one. These bonds from minus 50 basis bonds have gone to 2 and 3%. The losses on these are much greater. And pension funds will have much, much bigger issues than the ones that have in the US. We were talking about the pension crisis in the US, but the European one is, is pretty bad too. Just look at in France, they, they raised this week the, 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 the year that you, you, you take your pension from 62 years old to 64, and the country is burning to the ground. Now, uh, you understand that and it's 62 to 64. It's not like they made 62 to 70 years old. So it's very delicate. And the situation in, in Europe, given the negative yield bonds, given the interest rate hikes, and given one more thing, in Europe, given that Europe doesn't have the dollar and it has the euro, was mostly a supply-driven issue. It means that we were importing oil and energy from Russia and from everywhere. And all these commodities were priced in dollars. So as the euro fell, the price of these commodities were more expensive. So inflation was a supply-driven problem. Two, I think there's a, there's a report, I think, from the San Francisco Fed. Two-thirds of the inflation was supply-driven in Europe. So 
when inflation is supply driven and you raise rates to stop it, you're, you're using the wrong medicine to stop the problem. You need to crash the economy in order for this to stop. And this is not really efficient. Now, in the meantime, you have yields uh, going higher. And now the yields that we see on our screen on Bloomberg or anywhere are not the yield, real yields because the ECB is in and tries to contain the spreads. If you left the market alone, I am pretty sure the spreads would be much, much wider. And you have the new thing which came up this week when the Swiss National Bank decided that tier ones, additional tier ones, would be written off and equity holders and equity. Uh, holder would be saved. Now imagine what happened. And you you probably saw what happened this week. All the 81s in Europe got smashed because everyone says, I don't trust this instrument. I don't know. Yes, central Sorry. bankers will come Just to out. Be clear, these are the cocoa bonds that came out in, I think, 2013, right? Yeah, there are a few of them. Yeah, but it's they're a cocoa. It's contingent convertible. It means yeah, that they're convertible. it will be converted to equity if something happens. Let me put it as simple as, as it is. But these are supposed to be wiped out before the equity. So the question is, what prevents for something else similar to happen? Okay, the ECB came out, the BOE came out, uh, they said this is not accepted, but the fear and the uh, has is now everywhere. So you, you have a combination of factors. You have a factor that this ECB has been raising rates when I don't think it's a proper mechanism to address inflation in Europe. They've created a, sl a slowdown. If you see Germany's numbers and everywhere's numbers in, Italy, in Europe, the, the economy is slowing down fast. You have a discussion on the capital structure of lending, which is very critical in the way companies and banks go and borrow themselves. And all this at the same time. And when the US is draining liquidity from the global system, uh, I think the, the, the situation in Europe is, is very tough. I, I, again, after 2008, I don't think we have a systemic risk on our hands and the, the risks never materialize in the same place. Uh, but I think things are about to get tough and it's going to be much worse before it gets any better. Yeah, so what I would offer back, and I think everything you're saying is valid and <clears throat> Albert Tracy, let me know if you kind of what you think about this. But in the US, we have a presidential election next year. Mm -hmm. There is almost no way that we will see the US economy crash in the next 24 months because Janet Yellen won't let that happen. And so we may yep. see issues in Europe, and we may see Europe and the rest of the world suffer based on US interest rate and monetary policy, but the US will do everything, the current administration will do everything they can to keep the US from crashing in that time. And I'm not just saying this because of Democrats, Republicans would do the same thing to keep the economy afloat in the year before an election. Albert, what do you it, think about that? It just, it depends on, it depends on what is happening uh, specifically with the debt ceiling. Right. I mean, Janet Yellen and the Biden administration would gladly let the economy sink, the market sink anyways, uh, if they could blame it on a scapegoat, the GOP on the debt ceiling, not getting hiked. So that's that's definitely something you need to watch over the next six months, because it is campaign fundraising season and yeah. they just can't they can't you know, they can't really agitate their voters all that much, to be honest that's with you. Point. So, yeah, the, this is certainly the political component is going to be uh, high over the next uh 12 months. Yep. Yep. So, okay, great. Let's, let's move on. Thank you for that guys. Let's move on to energy. Can I say, can I say, can I say something more? Yes, that, that absolutely. Is, yes, please. What, what appears to be happening right now, at least in my eyes, is that the Fed is using interest rates to attack inflation mm -hmm. and it's using the balance sheet to give liquidity. So these two do not go in the same direction at this point. The question is if they can do this for a, for, for, for a long time. It doesn't feel to me that they can, but at least right now they're giving liquidity on the one side and they're raising rates on the other side. I, I'm not sure they can do this for that's, a long that's, We've actually talked about that at length here, but it's not the Fed, it's really the Treasury uh, sterilizing okay. QT. But yeah, it's yeah, one but, of the, always said- But they're coordinating, they're coordinating. Yeah, of course, they coordinate for the most part, but sometimes 
in the last six months or the last 12 months, uh, Powell and Yellen have been at odds uh, with each other in policy. So this is a lot of the reasons why the markets has just been topsy-turvy and don't understand which way it's going because you have conflicting uh, policy and agendas from uh, the Treasury and the Fed. But you're absolutely so you feel right. You're, so, you feel, so you feel it's conflicting or do you think it's coordinated and they're doing it on purpose? That, that's what I haven't figured out yet. I, I think. I, th I think the I think the want to eliminate excess cash in the system is coordinated, but I think the policy of how they're doing that is conflicting, and I, that's that's going to be a bigger problem, say you know second half of this year. Okay, sounds sounds logical, but you know it's one of these things that puzzle me. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or if they're doing it as you say because they, they're trying they're using other tools and they and they and they step on each other doing so. My rule of thumb is to uh, side with incompetence rather than conspiracy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, okay, it's not conspiracy when the Fed chairman talks with the Treasury guy. So uh, no, no, I, no, no. I listen. I, I am absolutely in your corner on this one. I absolutely okay. believe that you know they talk and and coordinate things for sure. I just think that their agenda at the moment doesn't line okay. up one hundred percent of the time. Okay. So. Yep. Very good. Okay. Thanks for that, guys. Um, Tracy, let's talk about energy for a while. We up until you know Friday, we had a pre pretty good week for crude. Um, I thought we were breaking that down cycle a bit, but but we're seeing some chop in um, in energy markets. And so we had a question for you from a viewer saying, "When do you see oil and natty in a sustainable uptrend?" Do you? Well, yeah. Um, net gas is a whole <laughs> other issue. I think it's going to be very difficult. Really, we're trading in the range that we've been trading in um, most of the time for the last, you know, 20 years or so. So, you know, that $2, $3 range has been very comfortable for net gas. We produce a lot of net gas. It's, you know, yes, we are building out LNG facilities. And yes, we have had problems with Freeport and such. Um, I just think that we probably won't really see a big spike in prices unless we see another energy crisis in Europe. Do you know what I'm saying? And that, then we're going to be have to forced to sell sell even more. So you know, for right now, you know, I would kind of get comfortable with that gas about that range. But if it you know if it starts breaking above like 375 or so, I would start getting bullish. But for right now, it's just kind of in that area where um, where it's been been comfortable most of the time, right? Um, so I think it, I think it's going to be a while for that. So we got to kind of assess the situation in Europe as you know we get to summer, um, you know, air conditioning use and to next winter if they have a bad winter. So kind of have to. I think it's going to be a few more months at least down the line for uh, natural gas. As far as um, oil is concerned, you know I. Uh, you know, Brent said about $75 right now. Saudi Arabia would like it around 80, 90 range is where they're very, really comfortable. I think right now, what we're going to have to get through is we're going to have to really assess. We we need more time to assess Russia's situation. You know, they just mm -hmm. extended that 500,000 barrel a day cut uh, out until June. Um, the latest records do show that they actually have cut that much uh, so far in March. Um, so the, the cut is happening, which also means that they're experiencing uh, kind of a, a pullback in demands, even though they have, and it's really, it's more on the product end, rather mm -hmm. than, I should say, rather than the crude oil end. Um, because you know they have floating storage, you know they they have ships piling up everywhere with product, and so I think you know that will help uh, clear clear their excess product a little more. So it's really on the product end, on that we also have to see, you know, everybody's freaking, you know, if if the Fed again decides to stop raising rates or pause, I think commodities will really like that situation. Um, just because of the cost of carry and transportation and storage for all these commodities is very expensive, mm -hmm. right? Because you're uh, accounting, you know, you uh, you get bank credit lines for that, right? And so I think that's putting downward pressure on markets right now. And then obviously fear of recession, you know, is 
kind of kicking in again after you know, the, the recent bank crisis in the U.S. and in Europe. And so I really don't think that we'll see higher prices. Um, I mean, typically we, you know, this is the time of year we do start seeing higher prices heading into, you know, high summer demand season. But we've also been seeing, you know, I think everybody expected China, uh, you know, China demand to just shoot up right away. That's taking longer than anticipated, which, you know, I kind of have been saying that on this show for, you know, quite a few months. Long time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, factors involved right now. I do think, again, it's higher, it's higher for longer. I mean, you know, uh, historically, you know, still prices at $70 is high <laughs> for, for oil. It's not like we're, the market is crashing by any means. Um, right. it, you know, just coming down from a geopolitically induced spike last year. Uh, but so I think, you know, it's higher for longer. Um, and, you know, definitely I could see prices, you know, go into, you know, that $100, you know, $110 range. Uh, but, you know, likely, likely into 2024. Um, not really this year. Okay. You know, obviously, unless something happens. Okay, so if you're do, do you think there's something, do, do you think if, if, if uh, Fed poses or for whatever reason, that's, uh, or if they do a rate cut, what do you, do you think that commodities will explode or do you think? I, th I think if they cut, commodities would get really excited. I think if they okay. pause, they would get excited. Right. Like, oh. I think, you know, I think we would see a, a rebound in a lot of these commodities, grains, things of that, you know, um, base metals and uh, industrial metals and uh, oil. Uh, but if they start cutting, then I think that they'll really like that because then they don't have to throw product at the market because they can't afford to store it. Okay, thank you. I'm actually I'm actually quite bullish for oil in the near term. Um, one of the reasons is I, I mean, I've heard through the grapevine that the, the chicanery in the futures market, and I'm reading that hedge funds and other money managers sold the equivalent of 139 million barrels of oil in futures over seven days a week and a half ago. So, I mean, this is like, it's to me, it's like they're just, they're almost out of ammo when it comes to suppressing oil at the moment. And any little flare up or any, anything is probably going to be bullish for oil and probably shoot right back up to 80. So what That's could just, that be, Albert? I, I mean, it could be it could be a natural it could be a natural event. It could be weather. I mean, some kind of economic policy stimulus from Europe coming out there, or even the United States going into um, like Tracy was saying, the travel season and whatnot. It could be anything, really. I mean, I think the market is just 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 begging for some kind of bullish uh, signal for them to run it up. Okay, and Tracy, if you're sitting in Europe because energy prices were such a factor in 2022, what are the main things that you're worried about? Like, has, has, has their nat gas storage, has that been depleted much over the winter? Is No, it wasn't depleted. They just started, had to start injections again, because okay. what we are seeing is that, you know, and, and this really started in uh, fall of 2021. Everybody kind of forgets that the crisis started before the Ukraine invasion. Um, but what we saw is industry start to shut down, especially industry like smelting and glass blowing and uh, things of that nature that uh, require a lot of energy, right? When nat gas prices started spiking. And, and that was well before, you know, that two, summer of 2022 spike, right? We, they didn't need to spike much where we saw a lot of those industries shut down. So what we're seeing now is that um, since prices have been muted for long enough now. Now we are seeing manufacturing um, and whatnot pick up when the numbers came in um, overnight for Europe. We're seeing manufacturing to tick up again. Um, we're starting to see uh, some drawdowns finally in, in storage. Um, Spain in particular uh, has really ramped up a lot of their industry that had shut down prior. And so if people, I mean, and I, I have to say, natural gas prices are still more expensive than they typically are in Europe, even at 
this price, right? They're still higher than normal. So this is also why we're not seeing, we didn't see a flurry of activity as soon as prices came down. You have to realize that relative to where they were, they're still generally high. But we are seeing, I think people are getting used to kind of this price range for uh, TTF, AON, which is Dutch net gas. Um, and so we are seeing in, in manufacturing and industry pick up again in some of these traditional industries that require a lot of energy. So we'll have to see. And if that really picks up, you know, the, the companies are going back to where they went to they went to fuels instead of gas. We're seeing them go back to gas now. And so okay. that's really what I'm watching on the en energy end is does this, you know, is this just a one-off kind of or you know does this continue throughout the summer okay so then, whole... sorry and then everybody's favorite energy secretary jennifer granholm ha had some comments about um refilling the spr this week can you fill us in on that and what does that mean for markets basically she said we're not filling in the spr refilling the spr anytime soon sorry she said a few years which means a lot more years unless there's you know a change of administration and uh, a, a policy change. But I would say from, you know, right. I would say until the election, <laughs> right. not gonna see an SPR, which makes sense because they know that if they fill the SPR, what's gonna happen? Oil prices are likely gonna go higher and they can't afford that going heading into an election year. And so I think that's, you know, really why they kind of pushed that off. Um, that's kind of what's going on with that. Why don't we just start? Can they be saying them? something? Can they be saying something and doing something else? Yeah, but we we would know if they're actually filling the SPR or not because they have to, it's a public bit. It's a public. It's a public uh, auction. It's well, okay. Yeah. Why don't we just stop <laughs> calling it the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and just call it the Petroleum Reserve? Right. There's nothing strategic about the way they're using it. <laughs> The tactical petroleum they're reserve. They're so. using it as a, as a piggy bank, right? Or, yeah, uh, or instead of yeah, well, strategic, you can use slush fund petroleum reserve. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> so, okay, guys. Um, one last question. I, I guess, what are you looking for in the week ahead? We've had a lot of volatility over the past couple of weeks. Michael, what are you looking for in the week ahead? I'm I'm focusing on central banks and interest rates. I think the the issue will be banks again. I think the big stress in the economy is private markets and not public markets. VCs, private equity, all these uh, investments need to do write downs. It will take a bit more time for them to do that. It doesn't happen that fast. They don't adjust as fast as public markets. I believe that bank, we will see that stress mostly on banking stocks. A, because the cost of funding goes up. B, because the capital structure is put into a discussion. C, because they continue to, to, to raise interest rates and there is a stress within. I, I think focusing on what happens to the banks and to, the, to central banks, again, we're looking at the same thing, unfortunately, but the problem is not in the same place, but these are the indicators you need to look off. I, I believe that you're going to see inflation coming down fast. That's my expectation. Maybe I'm wrong. But okay. if you see inflation coming down, it will make the, the life much easier for central banks. And yeah, and for all of us. Do you expect to see like VCs, for example, some VCs uh, close up because of the cost of, of uh, funds and all, all, a lot of these banking issues? Or do you think it really doesn't impact them much? I don't know if they're going to close down because it's a five, 10 year investment. It depends if they can reinvest or if they have to liquidate. But I think funds are are coming up to their maturity, they need to liquidate or they need to roll over. It's going to happen at a much lower price than they thought, yeah. or they'll have to wait one or two years more. So yeah. I think that stress is going to show up somewhere. Okay. Tracy, what do you see over the next week? Um, you know, I think, um, I, I think it's, you know, sideways markets. I mean, I, there's not really a lot coming up as far as, uh, oil is concerned. I mean, uh, we have, uh, you know, the OPEC meeting is the following week, which we already know they're going to do nothing. Um, so um, really next week, end of month stuff. I mean, there's not not a whole lot going on in the commodities world, really, uh, news wise next week. So I think, you know, probably see the same sideways action. Okay, great. 
Robert, what are you looking for? Let me let me ask a little bit of a, a kind of loaded question with that. As as springtime is coming in in Ukraine, do we expect that to heat up at all uh, as as things warm a bit there? Uh, well, yeah, I would say yes. Geopolitically, I think it would be advantageous for Russia to do something to save face. Absolutely. But um, for the week ahead, I think the narrative shift, I'm watching for the narrative shift of interest rates to banking, like Michael was talking about. I think Yellen is most likely going to come out and try to guarantee 500,000 in deposits and even talk about 750 and get it up there and just get the crisis over and done with. So that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Wow. Would that require con congressional approval? No. No, they no. can use it for emergency powers. Okay. Everything's emergency powers. Great. <laughs> All right, guys. Perfect. <laughs> like COVID. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and all your insights and have a great week ahead. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for having us. Have a great weekend, too. Thank you.